Michal Martin, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you very much indeed. It's very good um, to have you here. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, I just want to get a bit of context on things first. What age were you when you joined Fianna Fáil? I was about um, 19 years of age, yeah, 20. In 1979, in UCC, uh, right. I joined the Fianna Fáil Cumann. Now, I hesitated there a bit because the engineers took over the Cumann. Right. <laughs> <laughs> in one of these classic college coups, yeah. uh, when, the, when the engineers just came in and infiltrated the meeting. And, and uh, we, we'd been anxious to, to restore the Fianna Fáil branch or Cumann in mm. UCC. It had been dormant for quite some time. I'd come into UCC in 1978. Uh, but uh, I became uh, chairman um, in 1981 of the Cummins. So uh, that was my first real involvement in, in, in formal politics. But Fianna Fáil then was a, a, a colossus. Like it was a, you know, it had won the 77 election. It had, like, what would you say the key difference is as a party? It is between the party you joined and the party now. Well, without question, the scale mm -hmm. and size uh, w w was, was a, a, a clear difference. Um, it, it was enormous. And if you look at the results of that election, people are winning, you know, we're winning three seats out of five, mm -hmm. three seats out of four, maybe in one or two, one constituency, if I recall uh, accurately. Um, n never less than two in a four seater. Um, and, and so on. So it's very dominant from that point of view. Very strong personalities um, in, in, in 77, mm. 70 period onwards. Uh, Jack Lynch, uh, Charles Hawhey, um, Brian Lenehan, mm. Michael O'Kennedy, Kennedy, Jared Collins, Desi O'Malley. Desi O'Malley mm. big, big figure and must have become even larger again in, in, in terms of, of, of personality. Um, and many, many more. You know, Martin O'Donoghue period, Ray McSharry's, um, they all came uh, Charlie McCreevy was a newly elected TD, wouldn't have been a big personality then. Um, and um, of course, what people may not realise, and again as an, a student and a young person coming through the 70s, it would have been particularly dormant in opposition and, it would, and mm. Jack Lynch's party in opposition would have been considered very lacklustre and so on, which most oppositions get t told they are. Um, but then 77 was a renaissance and Seamus Brennan, of course, was the architect of that. And so what was lo it looked like a modern modernity. It was doing all the new techniques mm. um, in terms of, of, of marketing, presentation. Colm T. Winkelson is singing uh, My Kind of Country, mm. I think. And that's the first time you've just kind of razzmatazz in the general election. Uh, I, I recall uh, Gary Murphy writes that even the use of the word manifesto was a new thing because traditionally the mainstream party shied away uh, from the word manifesto because it had uh, connotations of the, 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 the communists and the communist right. manifesto. And so yeah. Hawley would say only communists had manifestos. Right, okay. <laughs> you know, not Fianna Fáil yeah. <laughs> in 1977. So it's quite interesting from a political science point of view or a student point of view. I was at my very first rally in 77 actually. Right. Um, and my father brought me down to. Uh, Patrick Street, when yeah. he still had rallies, when Jack Lynch was doing his final election address in Cork. And to give you perhaps a quick illustration mm. of how the, the connection to the founding of the party and the treaty in the Civil War was even then, even though Jack Lynch, a mild-mannered man, when he was asked, you know, at the time, how many seats will Fianna Fáil win, he said mm. 77. Mm. So my father said to me, you, you know why he's saying that, don't you? And I said, no, no way. Well, he said, that's the number of people that were executed by the Free Staters during the Civil War. Right. You know, so yeah. and he said, Jack is appealing to the base. He's just letting... Uh, so it's interesting. Those are the kind of nuggets you pick up as a young person. Uh, but when I went into university, it was a totally different story. We, we, we are then into the Hawhey Collie. Um, mm. Jack Lynch re re resigns in 79. We're into that kind of very volatile period. And that was manifested and reflected in the common. There, there were different wings in the common. And then you had the hunger strikes coming in. And, you know, I'm a history student mm. and um, I liked campus at the time. It was a place where there was cross fertilization. The Philosoph was the debating society. That was the big social event. That might sound right. sad now. <laughs> it was on a Saturday night. Yeah. It would be packed. Uh, you'd go there. Uh, if you've, you know, you're hoping to meet your, mm. uh, someone that you fancy there or whatever else. You went for a yeah. few pints after the bar. Um, and you went out to some house afterwards. Uh, and that was the big, night of the, we didn't go, go to nightclubs or things like that as students, we rarely did. Um, didn't really, that wasn't part of the scene, you didn't have the resources or whatever like that. Um, and, um, but I also remember that hunger strikes introduced something new and it became really visceral um, at the time. 
Uh, and I found myself becoming more active. I mean, I never at that stage saw myself as a public representative, never saw myself becoming a TD. Mm. My ambition at that stage was to be a history teacher. Um, and but with an interest in current affairs, which was instilled earlier in life in second level by mm -hmm. an English teacher who got me to look at current affairs stories and to come in the following day and talk about them. Um, so that whole northern thing, the whole Northern Ireland issue was the, I think, the genesis of my real involvement in, in, in active politics. But when you say it was becoming more visceral, what do you mean by that? <coughs> I remember during the hunger strikes, and I can't recall the specific motion, but there was a general meeting in the rest in UCC, which is the old restaurant, mm. student restaurant. And it was jam-packed, I'd say, six, mm. seven hundred people. Uh, and you had different people on the spectrum arguing, uh, you know, that we would do this and do that and against Thatcher and so on. I would have been in, in a sort of coming from a strong Republican family, yeah. um, Fianna Fáil Republican family, uh, and a, a lot of negativity towards Britain at mm. the time. That's where um, you would have been coming. That's what you. That's would where have I was held. coming from yeah, at the yeah. time, and I remember standing up on it on a, on a, on, a, on a table, uh, and literally I could feel my entire body shaking, and just giving it hell at, as my that was probably my first speech, mm. uh, to any gathering. Um, and what did um, you say? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like looking back at it now, <laughs> but I was probably having a gist of it. I was having a good go at the British yeah. and the government. And anything we do here cannot, in any shape or form. Uh, give the impression that we, we were supporting the, the British government mm. line or whatever at the time, mm. or the, you know. Uh, and um, but what's interesting is uh, after that, um, shortly after that, about four of us decided we'd go up to the north mm. on um, a learning experience, and uh, uh, one from Ogrefina Fáil and two from the Common in UCC. Um, and the four of us visited Northern Ireland, and that was an eye opener. Began to bring new realities. Uh, onto me particularly, we met everybody. Yeah. Our very first meeting was with the UDA and Andy Turi, mm. uh, who was the leader of the UDA. And I was a bit naive uh, <laughs> going in there because we thought we were meeting young UDA and right. that the young UDA person turned out to be the bodyguard to Andy Turi. Okay. Uh, subsequently, we went, so, and we met them. There was a new political kind of movement developing in loyalism mm. at the time, and we were anxious to, to tap into that. Then we met a loyalist, Alf Midgley was his name, a uh, social worker in the Shankill. And his um, father had been a Labour MP. He was very informative and insightful in terms of the relationship between loyalist working class and the unionist parties and the dominance of the latter over the mm. former and the degree to which they would exploit loyalism. And loyalists were quite open about that at the time. Um, we met young unionists in their homes. Mm. And I will never forget, they really shout, uh, barking at us, you know, giving a very forceful message to us. People say it's the uniform that they're killing. It's my uncle. Mm. Uh, it's my cousin. It's no uniform to us. It's mm. our kith and kin and it's our family that have been murdered. And that stuck with me. Uh, mm. This idea of uniting Ireland by killing the uncles, the fathers mm. of people that we allegedly want to unite ourselves with, um, that jarred with me and began to jar. No, it took me a while to... But it wouldn't uh, have jarred, like it was that trip that made it really jar. It was a start, yeah. it was because I'd met unionists face to face in their homes. I met the STLP, we met Sinn Féin, we went into their headquarters in West Belfast and that was during um, the hunger strike period and one of the hunger strikers was um, uh, coming close to, 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 to the end of, mm. of, 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 of his life at the time. Uh, and that was a very, and, and on the other side, I saw what uh, an army of occupation meant. I mm. mean, the Falls Road and the British Army up and down, it, it was, to all intents and purposes, uh, an army of occupation. But I remember watching the exchange between Joe Austin, who was a Sinn Féin, who became a Sinn Féin, I think, mm. elected representative for a while afterwards, roaring down at a young British soldier. And the chemistry between the two, and I was wondering who was more afraid of, of whom. Right. And I thought that was very interesting. You could see Sinn Féin in the ascendancy at the time with the, the amount of international media attention that they were mm. garnering uh, and using at the time. Um, and so was, that was the beginning of a journey in terms of, 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 of Northern Ireland for me, which mm. took a long time. Uh, and then, you know, one is always constantly learning. I, when I became a TD, I, I joined the, I went to the British Irish Association meetings in Cambridge and Oxford once a year, where we would meet politicians from all sides, civil servants, um, police, mm. uh, army, people off the record, foreign affairs from uh, our own Department of Foreign Affairs, and where things were thrashed out off the record, Chatham House yeah. rules, and you got a better insight. 
And I went to a lot of those kind of sessions. I went to Ballet Castle, Coramelia, where I would have, there's a reconciliation mm -hmm. centre run by, run by the Quakers. I met David Irvine there for the first time, Billy Hutchinson, mm -hmm. two loyalist activists. I think David Irvine was a fascinating individual who understood Southern nationalists better than we understood ourselves. Uh, I, I enjoyed my meetings yeah. with him. Uh, and uh, I think I would recommend anybody out there who has a view in the North uh, to suspend your own prejudices and try and understand where the other person is coming from. I would have been friendly with the Majimsi brothers, uh, got mm. to know them during that period. Yeah. Uh, they came to Fianna Fáil meetings and so on like that. They I'm were running the, a bit ahead. They were the brothers who took the, the, the action against, that's right. against, uh, yeah, against the yeah. Constitution. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, but to go back just a second, you would say before that trip, violence as a means of getting United Ireland, would you have had a view that it was a sort of a necessity? Not to get a United Ireland. I was mm. never, if I'm honest, uh, I'm not a great advocate of violence. Mm. Um, but I would have, you know, in terms of the War of Independence and that. But in terms of the North, in 69, 70, 71, that earlier period, um, you are you have, of course, the, the, the Bally Murphy, you have um, killings, you have the... Mm. Uh, Bloody Sunday um, atrocities, both Bally Murphy and Bloody Sunday are on a par in mm. terms of the paratroopers and, and, and what they did on those occasions. Uh, and that, I suppose I was only 12, 13 at the time, that hardened opinion in the South. Mm. Um, um, but uh, when, when, when at the time, you know, I would have been a constitutional Fianna Fáil yeah. in, in loose sense, but um, would have perhaps, I think just Johnny Murphy coined you know, were there sneaking regarders yeah. or did people have a view that, uh, you know, this was justified? You know, I think we were insulated too much mm. from the realities of the North on both sides. Um, and at the time in Fianna Fáil, there was uh, the decade earlier, you had the convulsions over the arms crisis mm. and that lingered on afterwards. Um, so it took a long while, I think, for generally in, in the South, uh, for, the, for the principle of consent to be truly embedded in, in, mm. in public thinking. Um, I'm generally more of a peaceful pacifist type person. That sounds paradoxical in terms of uh, where I come from, but uh, it, to me, you know, the justification for taking another person's life um, ultimately uh, has to be um, self-defense or the preservation of one's own. Uh, I think there, uh, there, ha there has to be better ways to, to try and rid the co a, a, a locality or a community of injustice. Um. And when you say now that you know anyone who wants to has a view in the north should put you know look at f things from the other person's point of view, bringing us up to the present day, how well is that being achieved at the moment? Do you think? I don't think it's been well achieved at the moment. I think we're into a period of polarization. Um, there are voices struggling within the north to get heard. Um, I think the collapse of the executive and the assembly has been incomprehensible. It's in my view, it was a contrived collapse. That's a view I have. I mm. think Sinn Féin deliberately collapsed it at the time for their own electoral reasons. I, uh, there are scandals in all governments, but scandals don't bring down the entire edifice of, gov of government. You don't bring down a parliament because there's a scandal in the executive. You don't bring down the executive itself. What you do is you deal with the scandal, you have an inquiry, you try and find out who's wrong and deal with them. Um, but you don't bring down the, the entire edifice. And I genuinely believe that if the assembly and the executive was up in place, and up and running, you'd have some channels and some opportunities for unionism and nationalism to come together to try and at least manage the difficulties, and there are difficulties mm. over Brexit. The letter that Martin, the late Martin McGuinness and Arlene Foster wrote in 2016 uh, really was the way to go. And in that letter, they jointly acknowledged the unique circumstances pertaining to Northern Ireland and that they would both work together to manage their way through that. That's been lost since then. And, and I think the DUP bear responsibility as well. Mm. I think the DUP, in my view, have suspended um, their logic in terms of economics uh, and in terms of uh, endeavouring to understand that this is the best of both worlds from a market point of view in terms of um, farmers, traders, having access to the British market and access to the European single market at the one time. Do you think if they had been managed differently, they might have had taken a different approach to this deal? Do you think they've been backed into a corner or is it all of their own making? Well, no, I think there's been, I think there's, I think the Taoiseach at, at an earlier stage, in my view, took a particular stance in terms of publicly uh, backing them into a corner. Mm. Uh, I think his megaphone diplomacy hasn't helped at all. Um, and this isn't about metaphorically beating somebody up 
uh, mm -hmm. and winning the argument. Uh, this is trying to manage a, a very difficult and, and complex situation. Now, I think part of the problem is, and both Sinn Féin and DUP have had um, a difficult relationship with the European Union. I mean, Sinn Féin would have voted against every referendum in the Republic. Mm. They've now come over and at least are supporting Europe, although they say it must be radically reformed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, because they oppose Lisbon mm. 1 and 2, and I was the director of elections for Lisbon, and I can recall I'm talking mm. to Martin McGuinness and saying, what, what the hell are you guys doing opposing this in the Republic when you're getting so much funding through the peace money in mm. the North? But I'll also remember in Downing Street, we were negotiating the devolution of justice, and Sinn Féin and DUP weren't talking for about a year after Peter Robinson had become first minister. Again, it was suspended, another mm. suspension. And I met both groups after Lisbon 1 was defeated in the Republic. And the only bit of unanimity, and I met them separately, they were both delighted that Lisbon <laughs> 1 had been defeated, both the DUP advisors and the Sinn Féin advisors. Yeah. And so you have this kind of legacy hangover mm. about Europe uh, within the DUP and within uh, Sinn Féin, or Sinn Féin have overcome it uh, to some degree. Um, I don't know, I suppose you might call them the sneaking regardless of Europe, but mm. won't, won't come full-blooded in, in favour of the European Union. The DUP, in my view, um, had, had made a wrong call here. Uh, and I think they will, it, it will be damaged as a result electorally mm. in the North, because I think there's a middle ground coming in the North that wa want their politicians to focus on bread and butter issues, mm. not the constitutional issues all of the time. They don't agree with Sinn Féin saying we must make Brexit uh, a border poll. That was a crazy thing for Sinn Féin to do mm. in the beginning, in my view it upped the ante in terms of putting the unity question number one. I had said from day one, Brexit is about Brexit. Let's not um, fast track or accelerate mm. the unity question and roll it into Brexit. The unionists on the other side, the DUP, have now put the union above and beyond everything mm. else, above economics, above bread and butter for people. Uh, and we're not getting clarity um, or resolution between the two. And as a result, Northern Irish, Northern Ireland people, and particularly anti-Brexit people, don't have a voice anywhere now. They don't have a voice in, 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 in the Assembly, in the Executive or in Westminster. Um, if Sinn Féin took their seats in Westminster, would that give them a voice? It would. It would give them a voice uh, in Westminster. Do you understand why they I say do. they can't do that? I can understand why they're saying they can't do it. I don't agree with them. I, but what I would say to them is, look, if you don't want to take your seats, don't run for the election. Mm. That's the first thing I would say. A lot of other people like Mark Durkin uh, run for the election. I think Mark Durkin would have been a very strong voice at this particular time. He has good relationships with the Labour Party uh, and others in British politics from his experience there. He inherited the, the, the Hume mantle um, and, and Alistair MacDonald likewise. Um, and, and, you know, I think if Sinn Féin don't want to attend, let other people um, run and attend. But I would say to Sinn Féin, you know, you say you've signed up to the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. Now, whether you like it or not, the Good Friday Agreement implies the existing constitutional framework as per the Good Friday Agreement, which is an ordinary assembly, an ordinary executive, Westminster for those in Northern Ireland who want to attend, um, and then the North-South bodies um, and the British-Irish relationship. We, mm. we, 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 the whole idea was to have a referendum on the island to resolve the constitutional question, resolve the unfinished historical stuff about First, Second and Third Doyle and who has legitimacy and mm. who doesn't. And to a certain extent, Sinn Féin are saying we like one part of the Good Friday Agreement, but we don't like the other part. Uh, and I don't, you know, I think they should stand aside at the next Westminster election. Let, let other people go for it. And do you think the uh, the uh, idea of United Ireland, as it came up, came in, in the sort of in the uh, coattails of Brexit, has been has been damaging in that regard? Of course, it has been damaging. It has it, it has um, <coughs> taken the focus off where it should lie in terms of getting the best deal possible for workers. For, for business, for industry, and for farmers um, in, in, in Northern Ireland. It also has, in my view, to my, in, in my view, the Good Friday Agreement creates the dynamic for the evolution of relationships mm. within the North, on the island, and Britain and Ireland. And the, o the old idea of a unitary state, I think, uh, because of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, um, in, in my view, is not what we might once have mm. thought. So. The three sets of relationship that are enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement, the relationship between unionists and nationalists, between North and South, between Britain and Ireland, will always be there now into the future, even in a unitary context. Mm -hmm. You may have a Northern Parliament in United Ireland with Dublin as the, ful as the fulcrum. Uh, you will still have North-South bodies. You will still have the British-Irish relationship. All of that is central to 
resolving the age-old issues that, 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 that are part and parcel of the North's legacy and, and, and the, or history, the legacy the history has bestowed us. And the idea that you can ever shed any of those relationships into the future, I think, is, is, is a mistaken one. And do we have a, enough of an idea of what we want from a United Ireland, if you, when you put it like that, to have, have enough people thought it through? To no, not yet. But I think people will over time. We are working on it ourselves. Mm. But again, I think you've got to be careful how you, you do that. I, I, I think... Uh, if, so, for example, I would be very annoyed that the north-south bodies haven't been developed mm. more. You know, a progressive incremental approach that where it makes sense. Unions will say to me, we don't mind north-south cooperation. They don't like the formal institutional bodies, but I think they're a bit too precious about that at times, about mm. the, the formal bodies. But they've learned to work them as well. So Waterways Ireland works, Tourism Ireland works, the single, Europe, uh, single electricity market works. I remember unions mm. were very nervous of the single electricity market. No, they're not nervous of that anymore. Um, and, and the food safety, David Trimble said to me he wanted one food safety authority for the entire island. And yeah. that we stopped it apparently and the nationalists stopped it mm. across the table. Uh, we had that discussion before. Uh, now we have three food safety bodies on the island, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't quite make sense. Um, we've won in the North, one in the Republic, and then we have an overarching food safety promotion body. Right. So there, there's a lot we could do. I think there should be one enterprise um, mm. body for indigenous enterprise for uh, local industries because I've been on trade missions when I was Minister for Enterprise with companies from Northern Ireland and companies from the Republic. They have a lot to learn from each other. They get on with each other. Marketing goods from the island of Ireland. You know, no big political label attached to that. Just practical common sense using our combined resources to sell our goods and services and, and, and solutions to the world. But when you th think back to your trip up north that time and your past as a, as a student of history and as a history teacher, like how much do you think we get, how far do we have to go in what we know about each other like how how little do we know about union, unionism and the unionist people down here i think generally we uh, people know very little yeah uh, i think sport has probably the, has been a better bridge um I, I would have met ken mcginnis at a lunch in cork constitution mm. uh, in temple hill many many years ago when he came down with dungannon uh, and that atmosphere was a good atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I think rugby has been very strong on that uh, and has probably been a, the most effective sport. I think the GA are doing great work through the Ulster Council now, mm -hmm. um, working with schools um, in what might be termed unionist uh, tradition, um, you know, embracing the GA a bit more. Um, and I think there's, there's an awful lot more to be done. But in the Republic, there still is a long journey to go mm -hmm. to fully understand the North, not just to understand unionism in the North, right. but to understand the, the nationalist tradition in the North mm. as well. Uh, and um, that's work in progress. And I don't think we can, I mean, I would invest more in reconciliation programs. Sinn Féin have said you don't understand the nationalists in the North. What would you say to I, that? I would disagree with that. Yeah. I mean, I'm learning all of the time, of mm. course I am. But I've, I've invested a lot of time and effort uh, in meeting and understanding the politics of the North uh, from all sides, all my life. I, uh, even though I came from an education background and education is a passion of mine, I, as I said to you, if I'm to be honest with you, at that stage, the North was a catalyst for my interest, mm. as it was for many of my generations. Because you must remember, we were nine or ten when it broke out in 1969 mm. 70. All we knew as young people growing up was 30 years of the bomb and the bullet, terrible atrocities. Yeah. That's all we knew. We actually didn't think it could be resolved mm. or it would end. And that was a whole generations of people who didn't get to the north, didn't go for, mm. you know, for a visit or for tourism or anything like that from the south. And this gulf and barriers got worse because mm. of the violence. Um, and, but I kept, you know, during that period, I kept talking to people, kept engaged with people. I was fascinated by it. I read deeply on it. Um, and never realized I, would, I myself would be involved as a politician, for example, in the devolution of justice, negotiating with all the parties um, in terms of bringing that about. Um, and um, developing good relationships. But the work has to continue. There is a sense I have that from about 2012 uh, onwards, because after the devolution of justice, both governments, I think, took the view that hands off now, let Sinn Féin and DUP mm. run the show and let the, the, the politicians in the North run it, that things came off the wheel a bit because mm. of that. And I think both governments were disinterested. Uh, and I'm not just saying that. People who've been involved for years on a nonpartisan way are saying the same. Uh, and that the eye was taken off, off the North. Uh, and I think it needs constant hands-on engagement from both governments. Um, and then from a people-to-people -people point of view, we need stronger engagement uh, across the sports. Boxing is another one where 
uh, there, there is potential. Soccer is one that we should work more mm -hmm. at. I think there's some work now beginning to develop on the soccer front, but again, we could do more um, there. But if you put in something cataclysmic then like Brexit into that mix? It's very difficult, but Brexit has damaged it. Brexit is a big, big worry in terms of what it's doing to the North and, and the degree to which it's polarizing opinions mm. um, in the North, and it's a big worry, and, and I worry about that. And if you look at, like, obviously we were very aware of the ignorance of British, a lot of British politicians when it comes to the North, but also maybe a complacency, they thought, because there's a, a peace process and a peace, that, that nothing, nothing is going to change, which again will be part of their ignorance of, of Irish history, of how th things can change quite quickly and have changed. Absolutely, and I think there is that complacency abroad. Mm. Uh, I also think there is that level, and I don't like you accusing other people of being ignorant because I think it sounds a bit kind of arrogant or whatever, mm. but there is a, a deep ignorance, of maybe a, a disinterest in the North yeah. from a lot of British politicians. Not all of them mm. are up to speed with Northern Ireland. So the degree to which they perhaps understand and get the potential damage that Brexit can do um, uh, to the North, for some, for the mm. hardline Brexiteers, that doesn't seem to be going through. Although I'll, ha I'll hasten to add that people like Michael Heseltine, mm. Nick Clegg, Lord O'Donis and those, and Tony Blair and others have come to us mm. and said, the majority of people in Westminster get the Good Friday Agreement mm. and believe that we should talk more about that when we talk to British politicians um, and the importance of the preservation of the principles mm. of the Good Friday Agreement and that that matters to a significant number in Westminster. Uh, particularly Remainers, that, mm. that, that they think that's their strongest argument. Well, we had Alistair Campbell on the show a few weeks ago and he said that the really the majority of MPs in Parliament want to reverse this. If they could speak freely, that's what they would want. And I'm interested that you touched on, on Lisbon there because you know Alistair Campbell is leading this campaign for mm -hmm. a second vote in the UK. And one of the things he mentioned when he was here was that he felt the EU would give some concessions uh, if there was a second vote. And I was wondering from the point of view of Lisbon, first and second, because there is a kind of a, an idea abroad that, you know, it just was a, a second referendum. Ireland voted it down and they just decided we'll just throw it out again, again a year later. But there was probably a lot more to it oh, than that. The, the comparison between Lisbon 1 referendum and Lisbon 2 is enormous. Yeah. Okay. I was appointed Foreign Affairs Minister and within that week we had lost Lisbon 1. So my very first foreign affairs meeting was to meet all the other foreign mm. ministers after we lost Lisbon 1. And initially, the, I always remember the first um, um, press release that was going to be issued by the president, I think it was a Hungarian president, would have, be, would have killed any chance of a second referendum. Right. Uh, and I, we changed it, the Irish changed it with the help of Swedes and others and said, look, the first thing you do, you um, acknowledge and respect the vote of the Irish people mm. and give us a period of reflection to, yeah. to think this through which they did in the end. So I guess about three to four months, uh, and we did a bit of work. But we did enormous research on why people voted against Lisbon 1. Mm -hmm. uh, we, in UCD in particular, the team there did a lot of research uh, around nationality, all of that, um, and then more deeply about the, the, the factors. And of course, it was the corporation tax was one. Losing your commissioner, for example, mm -hmm. was another. If you remember the posters, vote no and keep your commissioner. Mm -hmm. At the time, Europe was talking about rotating your commission. You might get one every eight years or 12 years, as, as opposed to every four years, which we do now, like everybody else. Uh, neutrality and independence was a big one. People had put up the view that there would be conscription in the European army. Uh, abortion was one at the time, that, mm -hmm. the, that Europe would tell us what to do on abortion. So we then went to work with Europe, and we did negotiate. and. Um, uh, we did a white paper on Europe. So that was one angle, so mm. we negotiated, we got the commissioner back. Now Sarkozy wanted one for the French as well, as far as mm. he was concerned, France should never be without a commissioner. Mm. So that was an, an easy win, but yeah. we were able to say, you had a poster up saying, but no, now you have your commissioner back. Mm. We've negotiated that. We got a protocol on corporation tax, so it was a sovereign matter, only to be decided by the nation of states. Sovereign, we got a protocol on abortion. A protocol, we changed, we changed legislation on defence. Uh, the Green Party were in government with us at the time. Uh, in terms of preserving our military neutrality. Um, but then, so we did win mm. those kind of concessions, but the crucial point was this, that, and the party did this kind of research as well, you see, if you start lecturing people about their first decision mm. and tell them they were stupid and yeah. wrong and ignorant, and please change your mind, all you do is harden their position and you lose some of the soft vote that went yes to, mm. to, to, for Lisbon. And so we picked up very early on. I had to tell some real Europhiles this. People were 
so I'm not even wrong with Europe, but stop telling people they were wrong. Mm. Tell them we've listened to you, we've heard you, we've made changes. Please, will you now consider voting yes? Will you please be open to voting yes? Mm. Remember, in every election, and I tell Alistair Campbell will agree with this, and he knows this, you have hardliners, you have soft yeses, you have soft noes. The magic is always to bring the soft yeses and the soft noes, or to keep your soft yeses and bring your soft noes mm. over if you want the yes vote. In my view, that's very doable in Britain. Um, but but it can't be done in a kind of a, a sort of a, without proper. I was shocked when, when I met Philip Hammond mm. uh, um, at the British Embassy function. I was shocked at the sort of complacent manner they were contemplating a referendum. Yeah. I couldn't really, given our own, given our own experiences, yeah. just couldn't understand. I knew they were walking into a potential disaster here. They thought they'd have a row in Brussels, win the row, come back, have the referendum, win the referendum. It doesn't work like that. And I just want to finally say, like, like along with all of that, then we created a new elec um, approach to the referendum. Mm -hmm. So we, we made it more civic and less political. So we created a young generation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, was a, they had a title, but suddenly if you looked at the programs back on Lisbon too, you have young articled people from mm -hmm. college who want their Erasmus program and so on like that. They were the advocates for uh, Lisbon too mm -hmm. the second time around. Uh, we got the farmers a bit more proactive than they were the first time because they were very negative the first time over some trade deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the trade unions were more energetic. We worked at every level of society for Lisbon too mm -hmm. and talked to them. People who were naturally pro-Europe but who had a gripe about one thing or the other and didn't put the shoulder to the wheel on the first referendum. Mm -hmm. and, but that, and, and the final winner really was the notion that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. I was under no illusion. People didn't vote yes for Lisbon too, on the basis that they suddenly had a newfound love of the European Union. The storm clouds were gathering economically, mm. and paradoxically, a lot of my colleagues were rushed, telling me, rush, will you hurry up? And I said, no, I won't, yeah. I'm taking my time here. Um, but the storm clouds gathering was a help, because mm. people felt greater safety in the herd, and said, the devil we know is better than the devil we don't know. Mm. And that, that, that will be similar in Britain. I mean, ultimately, I think that will be the call. But a lot of what you looked, they've looked over the cliff now, they don't like what they see, and a lot of what they were promised hasn't materialized, um, and it's clear there was no blueprint. Um, so I actually think, and I would have been very dismissive of this a month mm. or two ago, I met Vince Cable three weeks ago in Madrid mm. at the Aldi, so our European party grouping, and he said it was a 30% chance of a second referendum. I rang him last week and he said it's probably a 50% mm. chance of a referendum. And so I certainly wouldn't rule out a referendum, um, but what you're saying there makes it sound like there's a lot of uh, readjusting to do to how they would be approaching it if absolutely. they go for it. Absolutely, yeah. And the deep, a deep understanding of where the people are is your first port of call. So would you call it a people's vote? Do you think that's a good uh, title for the campaign they're running at the moment? It is so far, yeah. I haven't done, I wouldn't be yeah. a party to the research yeah. or what's going on in terms of understanding why Britain voted to leave the European mm. Union. I think my own gut instinct is there was a lack of a, an emotionally compelling argument for the, for, for the Remain side. Mm. The No side had the co emotionally compelling sound bites, let's take back control. Mm. Um, and then they had the immigration fears that yeah. they stoked up. Um, and so you do need, and I think it's in just two aspects that to me are emotionally compe compelling. One is the young people of Britain voted to Remain. Mm. There is a sense that the young people feel their future has been taken from them in terms of the, the, the vote to leave the European yeah. Union. So I would have a powerful, if I, and again, it's a terrible Irish politician <laughs> saying what I, I'm just talking here yeah, to you, yeah, yeah. objectively, as an observer, <laughs> if you were asked to reinvent yourself yeah. and go and run the referendum in Britain, what would you do? I would certainly use, we've deprived our young people of their future in Europe mm. as a number one. And I remember towards the end of the last referendum, there's a brilliant letter written by a, an RAF veteran of World War II. Mm beautifully written, where he must have been in his 90s, and my dead colleagues would turn in their graves yeah. at the degree to which we're undoing everything we fought for. Mm. Because, of course, they fought for Europe yeah. and, the, and the, the freedom of Europe uh, at that time. And that generation somehow, uh, some believe they're going back to a glorious mm. past, but others do get it that, that um, the role of Britain in the modern era is not as an isolationist mm. country, but rather as a driving force within Europe. And I experienced it. I was at summit meetings and at a time when foreign ministers would be at summit meetings, and I was there with Brian Cowan. Uh, you know, Gordon Brown was a very significant figure at European yeah. meetings. Tony Blair was uh, at Europe. And there were leaders in climate change, for example, mm -hmm. big leaders. Britain were leading the charge in Europe 
with the Nordics on climate change. And from a, a global geopolitical point of view, Britain's a huge loss to Europe. Yeah. One of the few countries with a bit of heft mm. who could stand up to Russia. Mm. I mean, Europe is meddling. Sorry, Russia is meddling in Europe. Mm. Uh, it's picking off states. It's gaining influence in certain EU member states to such an extent it can thwart European foreign policy. Mm. It can thwart Europeans' responses to issues. Uh, the, uh, when Britain leaves, Europe will be weaker on that front, will be weaker in human rights and weaker in terms of the basic common values of a parliamentary democracy, freedom of speech, uh, and all of that. That's a sense I have. And what does Ireland lose, <coughs> apart from the, the, the border and the trade we elements? Do we, what do we lose in the EU? If well, we, we lose a certain advocacy for yeah. what I would call the pragmatics. Uh, mm. Like Britain and Ireland, and others were good for putting um, pragmatic workmanlike approach to directives. Mm. Sometimes some of the directives coming from the Commission I mentioned the Nordics earlier, some of the, they can be very um, reg overly regulatory, mm. um, restrictive, not, in my view, facilitative of um, business or getting practical. Mm. Sometimes they're impractical. And very often British governments with Irish governments and other co coalitions would argue um, for, for, for directives or modified directives that made sense in terms of the normal business mm. of work, uh, business and so on like that. Um, when you talk about Lisbon there and you talk about the, you know, there was the financial clouds were gathering at that point, I want to go back then to the idea of Fianna Fáil as this movement and then uh, the bank guarantee and, and, asp and, and that part of, of Fianna Fáil's yeah. history and of Irish history and your own role in it. Like, have you ever looked back and, and at that and thought, like, what, you know, what was I doing kind of being part of a bank guarantee, stuff that you could have had no real knowledge of, the consequences of, you know, with respect, the training and the background for, like, it, it seems like, a, you know, you get a phone call in the middle of the night and it's it's a cabinet meeting. Yeah, and I'm in New York. You're in, you're in New yeah, York. Um, have you ever wondered about that as a, as, a, as a way of going about doing this massively uh, huge thing in people's lives. Well, democracy will throw people up or elect people, yeah. throw the wrong word, <laughs> elect people. <laughs> and ultimately I'm passionate about parliamentary democracy. Yeah. Um, and some of the best people in various ministries historically have been people with no academic mm. background. Um, and we've had economists in various ministries who wouldn't have been brilliant either. So it, yeah. it, we need to be careful of the simplistic. Mm. That said, um, the in terms of something like a bank, by the way, every almost every member state, not all, almost every member state had bank guarantees. Mm. Okay, and I still believe the bank guarantee had to be done. Um, and and any you know, if you read any analysis of it, most you know, a bank guarantee had to happen. But yeah. a bank guarantee. Yeah, but I mean, the the, the, the big risk was: do you leave one bank go? Mm. Do you leave Anglo go? Mm. And what's the knock-on effect? That's still been yeah. argued and debated. Would it have brought down the the rest? The, the big lesson I think where we got it wrong was in spending too much and reducing the tax base too much. There's a, there's a great analysis of the 28 crash um, and of course the conclusion is that the Fed was afraid to put the pin in the balloon. Yeah. And that prior to every crash, either the central bank or the regulator is always nervous of putting the pin in the balloon, of, of ending the yeah, party. Because yeah. you'll get blamed for ending the party. Mm. And you talked earlier about qualifications and so mm. on and making decisions. Actually, psychology is the big one. Right. Who's going to end the party? Yeah. Who's going to be gutsy enough to say, you're all partying too much or yeah. whatever, or you're, 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 yeah. you're overdoing it. I'm going, to pull, I'm going to really put the pin in the balloon and literally cause a mini recession as opposed to a, yeah. a big bust that will happen later if I don't do this. But you're talking about ending the party. Fianna Fáil were seen as people who were partying as well, weren't they? they were right, so the, we made mistakes. Yeah. We, we spent too much. Mm. We cut taxes. But the too links much. with developers, things like that. There was there was a, a sense that Fianna Fáil were enjoying enjoying the party, if you like. There was, yeah. There, there was that, you know, and there was lots of houses being built and yeah. so on like that. But but you could look. I'm not going to go into mm. re-arguing all of that. that. And that was part of the change. We accepted all of those um, hits, if you like, or criticisms, yeah. legitimate criticisms. We had to change tax as a party. But th that's uh, what I accepted the good dose of humility and yeah. The, the but is that difficult? I'm interested as much as how what's that like to come into? You know, you came in as leader then in 2011, and you 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 have this this wipeout, uh, and going from the movement you joined to this party that's now almost a kind of pariah. Like, what was that? It was a pariah. We were toxic at the time yeah. in the public 
uh, the steam and we had to the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that it was very difficult because but on one level the fact that we had come from where we'd come from as a party you know my grandparents were founding members mm. of the party foot soldiers yeah my grandmother on my mother's side now yeah were my grandmother was a common man woman she mm. laid out the clan malt boys in middleton she was involved in the rescue sean while and so on like that my grandfather was in the galti brigade he was in the rescue party mm. to not long and so on so i kind of grew up in that yeah. culture my father actually his brothers were in the british army the working okay. class family in north side of cork mm. Their parents died very young. He joined the Irish Army for some reason. He became a Devil Era supporter. Mm. But his brothers were all in the British Army. Okay. One was in a prisoner war camp in Changi Prison for three years. Mm. One, one of the most infamous torture camps that the Japs had when, uh, after the fall of Singapore. Mm. Now he came out of there in the end. And my father had a great time for him because he survived. Uh, it was a horrible experience. Uh, probably sums up a lot of experience mm. of Irish families. So we'd come, so I come from this. So there's a bit of pride. We're not going to yeah. let the ship go down. Right. On my watch, yeah. our, this generation of Fianna Fáilers aren't going to mm. witness the end of a great movement because it was a great movement. Mm. It built houses. I mean, I wouldn't. Be, I was the first generation of my family to go to college. Mm. Uh, we were the first generation to go to second level. My parents didn't get to second level schooling mm. because of their family circumstances. So we got to Creed Three and Turner's Cross. The Presentation Brothers were there with Don O'Malley three second level education. We get an education. So we were reared on that. That that's the kind of stuff Fianna Fáil did. Yeah. And I agree with you that to a certain extent we lost that esprit de corps. Uh, so, but I, we didn't want Fianna Fáil. Billy, people like Billy Keller rang me and said, look, will you go for the leadership? Will you please mm. go for it and we, we'll give it a shot? And 211 was existential. I mean, mm. we, had, we were in debt, I think, to 4 million or whatever. Yeah. We had 20, we, 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 well, going into the party, looked like we were going to get wiped out. Um, uh, we had, you know, and, 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 and all of that. Um, no, we came back with 20 seats. Uh, which mm. was a fairly difficult experience. Mm. I'm not going to pretend it was easy. You had a party with up to 80, 90 people mm. at one time between senators and, and TDs and, and, and NEPs. Uh, now you're down to 20, you couldn't eat around yeah. the table. Uh, that, was, that was a fairly uh, uh, chastening and <laughs> new experience. Yeah. Um, but you know what? We, we, we went at it and um, I, I actually saw it as a challenge, but I, I loved getting out on the streets and I just literally knocked on doors. But in, how did you uh, experience that toxicity when you were out on the streets? Well, it, prior to, joint 2-11 was, yeah. was, was hard. People were uh, angry, um, gave out like hell and so on like that. Um, did you ever think, that, well, we've this, this, we deserve everything we're getting? Like, did you feel that, that this is, and the party maybe doesn't need <coughs> to be reborn, that this is... Well, no, I never thought it shouldn't be reborn. I think it had a contribution mm. to make to Irish politics. I think a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that was being articulated as to what we should do. I mean, I think what we did during the middle of the crash, the bank guarantee mm. had to be done, for example. The six billion budget cut, we did, three, we did about two thirds of the budgetary correction. Mm. Now, that's political. It was political, um, you know, very damaging, obviously, when yeah. you're cutting all around you and so on like that. But to be fair to the late Brian Lennon and Brian Cowan, they took very right hard decisions at the time. Uh, I, I remember Brian Cowan saying to a party person, you know, it's not about the party anymore. It's mm. about the country. We have to do these things. Um, and we obviously paid an electro le electoral price, which is fair enough. Uh, I remember one member of the opposition saying to me, can you do one more budget before you lose? Right. Uh, to yeah. make it a bit easier for us afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because it was 18 billion was taken off in the matter of three budgets mm. in about two years. So you can imagine how that felt hit yeah. people's pockets. But I argued that that was the foundation for getting out of the crisis and getting to where we are today. Um, so, but then, uh, you know, in politics, um, what, what has happened now is that we have developed a new generation of politicians within Fianna Fáil, um, along with those who got elected in 2011. That will continue now. And in, a, in many ways, we've opened the door for new people to come in. Mm. And that's a good thing in politics. I believe in politics. I believe in democracy. I go to second level schools. I talk to peop young people. I'd love to get more of them involved in politics uh, because I think it's important in terms of stability, in terms of a good country and a country that we can cherish. And when, when you spoke <coughs> out on, on uh, ahead of the uh, referendum on the Eighth Amendment, like clearly it came from a, a personal place, but did you also think this is what we need to do as a party to represent a different generation and different people? Well, primarily it was born out of just years of experience, but also mm. meeting certain groups. I, I will always say to it that when I met four women who had had um, 
uh, abortions as a result of fatal, fatal abnormalities. Mm -hmm. These were women who wanted their children. They came into the doyle about two years before the referendum. So that, that I said to myself, I can't tolerate that mm -hmm. because they spoke about how they brought the, the remains of their babies back or couldn't bring them back mm -hmm. in some instances. That was terrible. And this mm -hmm. was our society doing this to, to, to women. Uh, and I couldn't, I said to myself, if I get a chance again, I'm going to change that aspect yeah. of it anyway. And then you move on to rape and incest. Mm. And if you can't comfortably defend it yourself, mm. then you can't impose it on somebody else. Yeah. If you're not comfortable with it personally, that you would, you know, in terms of a, a young woman who's raped or uh, has been the victim of incest and is pregnant as a result, mm. uh, who am I to impose upon that woman legislatively? A legal obligation to, to mm -hmm. proceed and have the baby. I, I, you know, that's uh, you had to examine oneself. Now, I also thought the Oireachtas Committee did very good work. I would have a lot of inter interaction with the five members we had on it, um, and talked to them. Both those who were mm -hmm. far different. Like three were for repeal, two were for change, but not full repeal. I spoke to all five as it was going on, and then over that Christmas period before the referendum, I read the transcripts from the medics from the obstetricians and from the legal people. There's no way you can deal with rape and incest without the 12 weeks yeah. uh, legal framework. There's just no way mm. you can deal with it. And when I spoke to people on the doorsteps, they would agree with you that they, they equally have issues with rape mm. and incest. They'd have concerns about the, the, you know, the fears that are said, oh, it'll become um, commonplace and so on like that. But I learned from 2013 when I supported the legislation for the X case, mm. we were told that there would be a deluge of women going out to look for, um, you know, abortions on the basis mm. or the excuse of mental health, which was not true, of course. Yeah. Uh, shocking stuff to be putting up. And of course, the facts proved that that was never the case, that women weren't going to be queuing up, as some people said they would, looking for termination on the basis of suicide. That never happened. Mm. And I, I think there comes a stage in your political life, too, when you stand back from all of the doomsday scenarios and all of the, yeah. uh, the damn, you know, what, what's the, the, the phraseology that people use. Life isn't like that. Life right. is complex. It's difficult. Life is grey. Mm. Life is not black and white. Mm. And we need to learn that. And I think all of that came into the mix when I <coughs> made my speech to the Doyle. And all I can say is I've, I was a much more comfortable person having made the speech and I could live with it. And what then surprised me, because you've made a point, you know, how would it go down? Mm. Uh, I was struck by the number of women who privately would call up at a mm. function call over to me and say thanks mm. for saying what you yeah. said. No big deal, that's all they'd say. And did you feel emotional so, when they would say that to you? Yeah, and, and it said to me, God, there's a big silent yes. Mm. You remember people thought before the referendum there'd be a big silent no. Yeah. I kind of learned after my speech there was a big silent mm. yes out there. And when you say life is grey and life is complex, I wonder how your own suffering has informed like your 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 wisdom and your kind of knowledge of, of of things i don't know that the answer to that question straight out um we've had terrible mm. devastating devastating tragedies in our life loss of rory um uh, after five weeks with a cot death yeah. um in, in 99 and um elena um in 2010 um both very devastating um they do change your life yeah. Um, I can't define how that, you know, define that for you now, mm. but it does do that. It's they will always be with us uh, as a, as a family, um, and um, you, you you they obviously shape you in different ways, and it remains to be seen maybe, uh, you know, how you can put words on that. I you know I I, mm. I don't really talk about it in, in public because yeah. our, our grief is, is is private and that, but I would say that. Uh, life does hit people hard yeah. and, and there are many people out there who've been hit very hard in life there is no magic wand mm. to wish away the, 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 the devastation or the grief you have to live with it um, and live with the and, and try and celebrate the memories you have and the mm. life that you've had uh, and with, with in our case with Le Lena and, 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 and with Rory and, and the very good times we, we, we had um, and the inspirational figure, figures that Lena was in our lives and so on. So you have to build up resilience, but I think you have to just, the ordinary routine things of life is what you go back to. You, you have to get up, mm. you have to carry on. Our children were great for us, um, and you have to get back up and just work. Um, 
exercise, get out in the fresh air. Mm. Um, this, the, the summer months are my strongest months in that sense. And um, getting down to West Cork where we, we all had, had great times and uh, just getting out and walking the middles and walking the hills and swimming. Mm -hmm. Basic things of life that can um, s sort of center you and, and so on. Is that how you do it? Because you did say you have to engage with life and get up again. And is that, but it's, a, it's, it's an, act, basic it's an act of will. It is, yeah, but I think your, your nature will, will, will also, I think, help you in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I've met other people who've, who, who and I remember, say, I keep saying to people now who suffer a terrible loss, mm -hmm. if I can have a quiet word, it's very hard to, to know what to say to somebody in, in a devastating situation like that. But I do come back to them and say, look, um, do the basic routine things first mm -hmm. and meet people. Yeah. Just try and get out and meet people as uh, uh, as quickly as you can. But how hard engage. is the, the most That's hard. It can be hard in the beginning. Mm. Yeah. I was reading uh, something by Nick Cave, the, the singer who lost his son recently, and he was talking about it. And he said, work and community, he felt, were the things that got yes. him, yeah. got him back. No question. For us, community is sport. Mm. Um, Nemo Rangers, our club. Mm. Uh, it's a home from home, um, and uh, Michal and Killian and uh, doing very well in football mm -hmm. and so on. And, and, and to be able to go to matches and things like that and just get back into it, because I've, mm -hmm. I've been a member since I was eight years of age. Um, community matters. They're great friends. I mean, we have great friends, and our friends came came um, really, t really to our rescue too and supported us hugely. Mm -hmm. So friendship, that's a great way of putting it, uh, mm -hmm. and I think it sums it up. Friendship, family. Our family are very strong for us. Um, our brothers and sisters and on both sides, Mary's side and, and my mm -hmm. side, have been incredible strength to us. Um, the friends we have, we, we're fortunate, we're blessed with such f deep personal friends who have, mm -hmm. who have been very good to us and, 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 and the wider community. Um, because I think in life, many, many families have gone through very, very difficult times. So I think a lot of people actually probably have an understanding mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, um, you know, I look back on my own father's life yeah. and I often wonder how he came through it because in, in some respects he was, I think, about 14 or 15 when he lost both parents. He lost his mother, for, his mm. father first. Yeah. And um, he then, had, I mean, he tells me he had to go up to the priest and try and get the priest to come down for absolution. The priest said yeah, they had no money and, mm. and, and didn't come down, you know. Um, and then he, his mother died a year later. Uh, in, in Finmars, which was at the time known as the, as, as, as the poor house at the mm. time. Now, he told me all this, and his brother then is, is, is a young man in, the, in a Japanese war camp. Mm -hmm. He has a three-year-old sister who, who ends up in an orphanage in Cove for a while, and she, she mm. came out of a great family. Their older sister kept them all together in the north side mm. of Cork, and he became you know, a very well-known boxer mm. and sportsman. Mm. He had a great life. He reared us as a family. And I try sometimes to cast myself back into that experience mm. and say, how the hell did they come through? Mm. Their big fear was the cruelty man at the time. Yeah. The cruelty man was the inspector went around and said, you should go into an institution or industrial school. Mm. And I remember when my auntie Maura was uh, in hospital uh, ill at the time, and I went to in just to chat to her. She was my godmother, and she's, she was going through that, reminiscing. Mm. She held them together. She was yeah. the matriarch. But she said, my big fear was the cruelty man, that he would start taking the kids away and, and things like that, you know. Uh, and so I suppose in many respects, there is a resilience in us somewhere. Mm. Um, but I think many families have gone through some terrible experiences. And I think we're not unique in that respect. And I'm very conscious of that. Did you miss your father when you went through what you went through? Like? Well, my father was, was, was with us at the time. Was he? he was elderly right. at the time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but he was a great strength to me mm. in the sense that I, I, I think he, uh, I mentioned um, David Irvine earlier. Mm. And um, it was kind of funny in a way, David Irvine, we were in a concentric circle and the Quakers had us running around, stop, talk to the man opposite you. So I'm, I'm, I'm opposite, this is a break, uh, yeah. breaking the whatever, yeah. barrier down, you know. So I'm talking to David Irvine and he said, uh, we're to, to ask the guy in front of you, what's the, 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 the big, who's the biggest influence and inspiration in your life? So Irvine asks me and I said, my father, mm. I'm sure who he was. And I asked Irvine, he said, Gusty Spence, I met him in Crumlin Road Jail. <laughs> 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 Two different experiences. <laughs> yeah. But so the father <coughs> is, is my inspiration of my yeah. life. And I, I kind of hung on to his every word. Yeah. He was a very wise and shrewd man and a good judge. Um, and um, would always go back to him for, mm. for advice and so on like that. You know? And uh, it, is, it is the... Uh, like the other thing about that I was just wondering is, is the public, you said you had to carve out space for the private self, but I was wondering, 
sometimes if the public aspect of your life was easier to maintain when you were going through those things than the private because again I was just looking at something you know, the, the, the private is a kind of w unknowable level of grief when you're suffering something like that whereas public life is difficult and you have tough decisions to make but it's straightforward and I was wondering if you found it in some ways that was the bit that you could handle easier than the private self if you know what I mean? Um, that's a, that's a, it's a difficult question. Um, yeah, I, I get your point in terms of in, in the immediate aftermath. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the in many ways, you're still working with the private for the rest of your life, yeah. in my view. It, it doesn't go away. Yeah. The public uh, bit, um, because you're an experienced, it's like any person going back to their work, you're experienced in it. So you probably can deal with that a bit easier. Although I must say that the public, we talked about community earlier, mm. The, the public are good in Ireland. Yeah, they respect your privacy, and they facilitate you in your privacy. And uh, I think it's a very good redeeming feature about the Irish, um, and about Cork people as well. But um, generally speaking, they, they give you space. Finally, do you feel uh, um, a pressure as as leader of this party that was a movement became toxic, uh, and is probably somewhere along the line now, like? Do you feel there's a, 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 a an added pressure to for what you have to achieve in politics because of you know things like you know the first Fianna Fáil leader who mightn't yeah, be yeah. Taoiseach that that kind of thing or is it essentially about what you want to achieve? In politics? I'm a bit more philosophical about it than that. I mean, sometimes I remember being asked that I think eight years ago. I think mm. Ryan Torbellini is very first late mm. late with me. You could be the first Taoiseach. I said that very well. Might be the first mm. Fianna Fáil guy never to be Taoiseach. Um, and at that stage, and then we had this big win. When I say win in mm. 2016, we mm. went from 20 to 44, mm. which in historical terms isn't huge for Fianna Fáil. But any party that wins 24 seats in the general election, that's a pretty good outing. Mm. Um, but I, I judge it in terms of where I've come from as leader mm. of the party, where I was in 2011 with 20 seats, became the largest party in local government within two years and the 214 local elections. And we still have work to do. Um, so I, I, that's my benchmark. Mm. And um, but do you have pressure from people in Fianna Fáil who I, are like harking back to the all the time? Yeah, I mean that's, our, that's the biggest challenge. People mm. in, in a lot of the calls I've made. So for example, and not running a presidential candidate, mm. the opposite view in the party was we are this great Fianna Fáil party, mm. so therefore we should have a candidate for the presidency. I'm mm. saying no, not exactly. Mm. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have a president a candidate. We have a very good president already, in Michael D. Higgins. Mm. Um, and we need to grow back to scale. I mentioned to you earlier the great personalities when mm. I was 19 year old. Mm. They were dominant national personalities. Yeah. I remember at the time, uh, you know, even when w you, you could have had Brian Lenehan, uh, John Wilson, mm. any of those could have been presidential candidates. Mm. It takes a while to build back to scale. There will come a time again, of course, when Fianna Fáil will have presidential candidates uh, and stuff like that. And uh, But that's a, that's a work in progress. So you get that sort of but we were the party of this, mm -hmm. can we be it now today? Mm -hmm. It's going to take time um, to recover. But we are in recovery mode. We will win more seats again in the next general election. I have no doubt about it. We have very good candidates in place. They're working hard on the ground. But it's a very community-based organization now. We're very much on the doorsteps. And um, you know, that, will, that will show it in terms of the next series of, 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 of elections. So I'm not actually overly bothered about that personally. Mm. Now, other people would want it for me, I know that, mm. and that's to be fair too. I'm not saying I would turn it down, by the way. Mm. Obviously, I want to be Taoiseach, and we're going to go to the next general election to, to, what we want out of the next general election is to be the party that's the lead party of the next government. So obviously, I want to be Taoiseach. I'm getting impatient. I'd like to get things done. I was in Greek Street with Mary Fitzpatrick, um, for example. Now, I don't know if you've seen the block of flats in Greek mm. Street. Appalling. Mm. And this palatial students' union block mm. has gone up alongside it. Mm. It's this tale of two cities. And why the government isn't giving money for the regeneration of those flats? Mm -hmm. Almost every flat had an inhaler. Mm -hmm. And some had nebulizers mm -hmm. because of the dampness. Um, I was shocked leaving there saying, you know, this is something in modern Ireland that we should have known more of. But is, the, is the housing crisis the, the thing that would make you end the confidence and supply or not continue it because it's... Yeah, it's the one I get most angry, angry about. Uh, this morning before mm. I came up here, uh, I would have had a clinic in, in, in Mahan in Cork. And what people don't get into statistics at all is the number of uh, young mothers, for example, um, who are living with their kids with their parents. Mm. I mean, you can now have 10 to 11 people in the house now. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not homeless. They're mm. not in any statistic, mm. but they're there. 
and they're waiting and waiting. We've people 10 years on the waiting list, mm. decent families trying mm. to get a house. Um, so I just don't understand, and I go back to what Fianna Fáil stood for in the 30s and the 50s, we built massive housing estates. Mm. There seems to be kind of a genteel... Do you think they can't do that anymore? Upper middle Times class resistance to building local authority houses. At, at is that all it is? I don't agree with that. I think it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, no question there's, a, there's a, an element of that in it. Um, and uh, we have huge money spent on HAP, mm. which is renting private houses. We're chasing this private sector, doesn't have enough houses. So mm. if everybody's after the few houses that mm. are there in the private sector, so the young couples can't buy a house. Mm. The price is too high. Young people starting in low starting salaries can't rent in mm. Dublin or in Cork or Galway or Limerick because the rents are too high. The younger generation mm. are, is the one generation in, a life, in, in recent decades that is suffering and yeah. whose future is no longer perhaps as clear as it might be, it might have been for earlier generations. You so, car insurance, trying to put a car on the road yeah. for a young person. If you're getting your job in Dublin, mm. how many times are you going to get back? The cost of rent here, how much do you have left at the end of the week? These are the issues that we're getting, you know. But they also lead to, does the government realise the volatility that that can cause? Like, there's a lot of uncertainty in people's lives and you, you see these housing protests, you see that it is causing a huge amount of anxiety uh, uh, beyond just the people most directly affected it's and do they underestimate maybe the volatility that can bring into the political system they do they do no question they do uh, they think they can manage their way through this for the next couple of years <coughs> a bit like the health crisis as well mm. i think Fine Gael have given up on health they just think health will always be with us mm. almost approach and on housing uh, i don't i'm not sure they understand the scale of it mm. still uh, in terms of how it's impacting not just on those who can't get those, but the entire family, mm. the entire family, uh, the mothers of the, of the mothers, so to speak, yeah. um, and the fathers of the fathers are, anxious, are are very, very worried and concerned about what the future holds for their young people if they can't get a house, um, and they're in very poor conditions. And we have to be careful about our interferences in the market as well. I mean, we were all for the re rent pressure zones, but I have to be honest with you and say, what's happening now in clinics is people are coming in with the letters because there are exemptions to get out of the rent pressure mm. zone. So people are coming in with letters saying, you know, from the landlord saying I have to repair and refurbish the house, therefore I'm giving an mm. expiry date for the person to leave. Or another, other letters legally written saying we have to, we're selling the house, I hereby swear I'm selling the house mm. and I have to um, give an expiry date for the person to leave the house. Uh, and so in some respects it seems to have accelerated some of the evictions which is only exacerbating the um, exacerbating the, the, the crisis even further. And then we shouldn't be afraid to do more on the supply side. Mm. We did some, we, we pushed for tax relief increases to keep landlords in, 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 in the system um, and to make sure that maybe a person with one house or two house might be incentivized to start renting out the house because we, we desperately need supply uh, and, it's in, and it's not coming quick enough to meet the growing demand for houses. Okay, Neil Martin, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Thank you.